Hello and welcome to the Mio and MMA podcast. Uh, we're on episode 80 something. I, I, I'm, I am really good at the numbers outside of the fact of remembering my own episode numbers. But anyways, here we are. UFC 285 predictions. John Jones, Cyril gone. And before I go any further, uh, check the description of this podcast or this video on YouTube. There is going to be a link to a link tree there. There is going to be a link to a Discord there. The Discord is the home of my manically obsessive creation of a mixed martial arts simulator, which I think you'll find fun if you're a little bit nerdy, a little bit into RPGs, role-playing games, and a little bit into MMA, which I assume you're very into MMA if you're here. So there you go. Check that out. You'll also find access to my social medias, other places that this podcast can be found. If you're looking for, if if you have a platform of, of, of uh, preference that is not where you're watching this, right this moment. All right, let's get in to the fights here. My picks, my analysis, my betting advice, informed upon by my 20 plus years uh, in this, and I do mean this very seriously, crazy sport. And this card is like a perfect example of said crazy sport because we got John Jones back. We got John Jones, Cyril gone at the top of this card. John Jones back at heavyweight. Kind of crazy. Um, that being said... This is a card that has a lot more flash than substance. If you'll catch my drift. And, and you can tell this almost like the, by the betting lines to a certain degree. Because you got two title fights. And you're like, all right, two title fights. It's, you know, really, really good. Then you realize that Valentin Shashenko is a minus 600 plus favorite. You realize that the fight under that is minus 500 plus for Shafkat Rachmanov. You have a minus 1100 or a minus 2000 favorite further down on the card, Bo Nickel. You have, uh, let's see here, what other ridiculous betting odds are there? Uh, Ian, Ian Gary, uh, minus 649 to minus 850. We'll get more into these fights, obviously, later on. We'll review these betting odds, but like, and um, there's a minus 400 um, favorite on the, like, the very bottom of the card. Not, not the opening fight, but the second fight up. So, from a betting odds standpoint, the betting odds tell us that this is not necessarily the closest contested fight card on the planet. A lot of the imp impressive fights are not. And to be honest, you have a main event of John Jones and Cyril Gaon that if anyone know says that they know what is going to happen, I don't think that they're being honest. Because I don't know what happened. And and I, to be and to be clear, I've listened to MMA Fighting's breakdown of this fight. I've listened to the Heavy Hands breakdown of this fight. And they're kind of, uh, you know, they're kind of in the same boat as me in the sense that there, there are several different pathways on this fight that you can go through because of John Jones's long time away, because of John Jones's prolonged period of not caring about fights and not taking them very, very seriously. You can see that with the Anthony Smith fight. You can see that with the Dominic Reyes fight, which I think he lost. And you can see that with the... Um, Tiago Santos fight, which a lot of people think he lost. Uh, I'm not really one of them. I do I do think he beat Santos. But the fact that it went to decision even against Santos, who is fairly highly finishable, uh, won because he's a, a bit crazy and a bit um, risk-taking. And the fact that he had one leg is, is you know, not an amazing sign because, like, his both of his knees, if I recall correctly, like, both his knees were messed up. So, um... Yeah, that's not exactly a great sign either. But we haven't seen, but I also I also do kind of believe that John Jones wasn't being super serious during that time period because there there were time periods before this, like when he started doing the whole bulk up thing and he wanted to like do a lot of power lifting. And then he had a really, really flat performance against uh Ovan St. Pru when he came back. Like another classic example of a fight that realistically, you think Ovan St. Pru, you think John Jones. That shouldn't be a close fight. That shouldn't shouldn't even really be all that interesting. Yet it was, uh, and of course it <laughs> we we do from the Gustafson one fight and the Gustafson two fight have actual proof that when John Jones says, "I was on a coke bender <laughs> before a fight," he may not actually be lying, and that's a distinct uh, that's a distinct thing. So there's a lot of like confusing stuff here. Um, what I do want to talk about real uh, first is um, goat status. 
a lot is being made of like, what does this fight mean for John Jones's goat status? Because it would be, you know, potentially a second weight, uh, a second belt, uh, light heavyweight and a heavyweight title belt, which would make him one of the few double champions in UFC history, one of the longest reigning champions at 205, and a belt that ostensibly he's never lost. And if I'm being honest, he could probably go back down there and I would have to think about it if he was going to beat Jamal Hill or Yuri Prohaska or whatever. So, you know, what is what does this fight mean for the GOAT? I, I don't think it means anything, really. Um, I think it enhances his resume and whatever. I, so not nothing. Nothing is the wrong word. But if you don't have John Jones at your GOAT right now, let's say he's not your number one right now. He's not my number one right now, for example. What would beating Cyril Gaon actually do to put him there? Because it's not his biggest win. This is a guy who's got wins over Little Machida. He's got wins over Mauricio Shogun Hua. He's got wins over Rashad Evans. He's got win over Rampage Jackson. A, a, admittedly, a bit of a past prime one. Daniel Cormier, twice. Alexander Gustafson, twice. Basically cleaned out the division, fought everyone you could think of. Uh, except for Anthony Johnson never uh, materialized. But aside from that, like, man owned a division for a really long time. Undefeated. Um, realistically, because the, the Matt Hamill loss is not a loss. Although, <clears throat> you could also turn this around. But I, I really do think he lost to Reyes. So that, that would be the blemish on the record. But this is a guy, and for what it's worth, he beat Chael Sonnen and Vitor Belfort, who, you know, not really in the weight class, but hey. Still names on the on the resume. I th- I don't think beating Gone puts him there. And and to be clear, like also, this would be kind of a fraudulent belt because this is Francis Ngannou's belt. Francis left the UFC as champion, has not lost, has not done anything. Uh you've got John Jones who has no wins at heavyweight, and he's fighting a guy who did lose. Convincingly to a highly compromised Francis Ngannou. So it wouldn't even really have that impact. Because I, I think realistically, the, the thing for me that keeps me away from putting John Jones number one, um, it's the outer cage stuff. And I, I don't even mean the, the coke binders, the legal issues, the uh, domestic views, uh, uh, violence allegations. Largely proven fact at this point. Um... And just the general being a scummy human being. No, I fully understand that that is <laughs> that is something you run in combat sports. That you are going to attract people who are looking for an outlet for otherwise undesirable energies. But for me, it's 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 sort of the steroid accusations uh, to a certain degree, and also the fact that the higher up in weight classes you go, which is another problem here, you're going up to heavyweight, the more John Jones is just freakish athletic ability, freakish physicality is more a factor of him winning than anything to do with his skill set. And to me, that's why I have GSP at the number one spot. I do have John Jones in my top five. He's on my Mount Rushmore. Honestly. Um, of MMA, I've got him with Fedor, GSP, and I don't really know who I would put in that fourth spot. I'm kind of thinking, I'm kind of looking for someone who like changes the sport a little bit to put there, but I don't have it. So I, I don't think that there's really anything to be gained goat wise here. There's an increasing of the resume, but he, I think he ends up being behind the guys you have ahead of him if you don't have him at number one. And if you have him at number one, obviously, what? You, you're going to be more number one? I, I, I don't know. Um, hey, okay, let's get to the fight. Let's get to the fight. All right. Jones has a three and a half inch reach edge. They are the same height, apparently. And this fight is largely a question of what does John Jones at heavyweight look like? Um, Obviously, he looks a little softer, although I will say this. The people making fun of his physique uh, on Twitter, social media and so on. I don't really get it. He has a he still has a better physique than like three quarters of the UFC's heavyweight division. So, like, what are we complaining about here? Like, yeah, he got bigger and he's probably taking in way more calories. Of course, he doesn't he doesn't look super cut. But like how many heavyweights do? 
Like, I, like we're, we're talking like Francis and Ngannou and like Sergei Pavlovich, and then like give me a third. I guess roided up Alistair Overeem um, would count, but uh, that is uh, obvious PED usage, documented PED PED usage. Um, Still, he is fighting a guy more his own size than ever before. Because while Alexander Gustafson is similar, he's a relatively thin guy. Jones would have a strength advantage there that he may not have against Cyril Gaon. He does have a reach advantage, like I said, but he's not. I, I feel like Gaon will command the range in this fight because Gaon is a good outside kickboxer by MMA standards. You know, creative jab usage, counter punching a little bit, works kicks to the body, to the head, to the uh, legs quite frequently. Jones has still rather thin legs that it really feels like should be kickable. And the problem is, of course, we haven't seen Jones look like a good wrestler in a long time. His wrestling predominantly was upper body in nature, and he doesn't seem capable, willing, interested. I'm not sure what the war I'm not sure what the scenario is in making that work. He's never had a great shot. His shot was successful because he was extremely fast and explosive, extremely athletic. And when I say that, I'm not trying to dismiss John Jones. It's the fact that any fighter is made up of athleticism, techni- technique, and what I call the intangibles, i.e. how you react to getting hit and so on. You know, how much you love the fight. We'll be talking about that with a fighter later as someone who has very low marks in that regard. And the thing was, as always, that Jones had incredibly physicality he had a lot of the intangibles dude is tough and uh tanks damage incredibly well um doesn't seem to be dissuaded when the fight is going wrong for him in any way shape or form but his technique was always a bit lacking there's there's nothing super great about his technique outside of i will say this his use of um elbows in the clinch and just in general like the spinning elbows he would hit periodically against like stefan bonner and stuff very nice. Very impressive. But his punching form has never been all that impressive. His wrestling form, never that impressive. Not bad, but never that impressive. So on. Also, and a lot of his grappling success comes from, again, that physicality place. He's 35 years old. And he's getting bigger. And like I said, when he messed around with powerlifting with Ovense, the Ovense Pru fight, he actually looked rather bad. And then we got to talk about the prep for this, which has been a bit weird because, of course, we have a video out there of him talking about, here's my hit squad, Maurice Green, Jorgen DeCastro, Walt Harris. And people are making fun of it. And people are trying to defend it. Like, that's not a bad cast of guys. And it's not. It's, it's not. Like, if you're going to look around for, like, heavyweight training pods in the world of MMA, you're not going to find particularly better than that. Like, for example, uh, Cyril Gaon is training with a 10-0 Dagestani heavyweight and, like, Alan Badeau. Like, uh, I, w- I will say that the Dagestani uh, heavyweight is more, at least, stylistically related to this fight, but not necessarily uh, a huge improvement on what we're talking about there with, like, a Walt Harris, for example. But we are talking about two guys cut from the UFC and also, they were trying to make a big deal about their size. I don't remember. They were like, they're 300 pounders. I'm like, I don't remember them being 300 pounds. Like, I don't remember them cutting weight in the UFC, honestly. Let's see here. Walt Harris. Last weigh-in was 264. Okay, he might be, I guess. But he rated uh, 254 for the uh, Volkov fight, so I doubt it. Um, Maurice Screen, the crochet boss. I actually like the crochet boss. Uh, yeah, he's like 240. And then we got Jorgen DeCastro, who, if he's 300, is uh, not the right kind of 300. We'll put it that way. Yeah, two, 261 and a half his last fight. Uh, in the UFC, okay, so he's like 
probably about 260. So yeah, even that was like an oversell of how big they are, which is just weird. It's just bizarre. But at the same time, it's like, is there anything that says from, you know, watching Cyril Gaon fight bad wrestlers and Francis Ngannou on one leg that suggests that if John Jones can just tank some damage, if John Jones can get in his face, if John Jones can implement a wrestling game, that he just doesn't get elbowed, that Gaon just doesn't get elbowed to to heck. Um, that's kind of my thing is like, there, there are two ways this goes in my opinion, three ways, I guess option one, John Jones comes out and out wrestles him and beats him up. Option two, John Jones comes out and wins a incredibly uninspiring kickboxing match <laughs> where he utilizes things like the clinch and like the threat of wrestling to make things just uglier and gone has no way of breaking out of it. Option three is well that, but gone wins and option four is gone goes out and styles on him. And I don't think the styling either way is the more likely, but it is definitely possible. I am going to go with Cyril gone to beat John Jones by decision. Because I don't, I don't think he finished him. Gone, gone, gone is a guy who is quite willing, quite happy to have a low place, low paced, ugly kickboxing match, and Jones will probably inevitably survive that. It'll look something like the Reyes fight, something like the Santos fight, and um, that's what I'm going with. But of course, that also could be uh, that could be also just uh, the fact that I. I have never liked John Jones early up. Uh, well, for a long time, I shouldn't say that. I liked him after he beat Stefan Bonner. I was like, that's a cool fight. He seems like a cool dude. He seems like he has a bright future. And then things went really downhill. Uh, <laughs> so there is that possibility that like, this is a emotional pick that I'm going with. Like, you know, Jones can't win. Also, and also I want the UFC to lose. In this, because Gon winning the belt, having lost to Nganu, will finally it, it, it'll it'll <clears throat> it'll give something that I think every fan has known that the UFC title is a prop. That no, just holding the UFC title does not make you the best fighter in the world, because the UFC picks and chooses who they actually want to pay money to. And if you have opportunities to make money, you can go elsewhere and make more money. And that doesn't make you a worse fighter. So, like, I guess I'm picking Francis Ngannou to win <laughs> and gone ending up with the belt. There you go. Um, uh, betting odds. It's a pretty close fight on the betting odds. You have a minus 155 to minus 175 spread on Jones, plus 130 to plus 145 on Cyril Gone. I, it could go either way. I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, uh, what do you do with a guy who hasn't been in the cage for like years? And to be honest, we haven't seen what I think is a motivated guy uh, in years, but I also don't know that he is motivated. It feels like his training camp is designed to make him feel better about things, more so than prep. There you go. Uh, Valentina Shoshenko versus Alexa Grasso. Half inch of reach for Grasso. They are the same height. Um, Valentina is coming off an incredibly humanizing performance against Tyler Santos. Showed poor fight IQ. Kept going into the area that Santos was having uh, success in, aka the clinch and grappling exchanges, quite repetitively. But I don't think it changed my optics on Sand on, on Shevchenko. Like, for example, somebody on Twitter um, asked me if um, during a conversation about about this fight, if Shevchenko's fight against Santos had, had changed my opinion. Uh, if if I if I thought that it had lost her fans or, or whatever, I don't think it's the case because, as far as this fight is concerned, Grasso is not Santos. She has an she has nothing remotely resembling Santos's game. And Grasso's problem or uh, and Shevchenko's problems were largely self inflicted 
throughout that entire fight. So I still think she's the best woman at women's flyweight. You could put her with the number one spot, uh, women's pound for pound, and I would not have a problem. Even though she's got the losses to Nunez, but like, you know, as we discussed with uh, Makashev uh, Volkanovsky, weight classes, you know, size difference. Grasso is a pretty, for women's MMA, pretty good boxer. Throws some nice combinations at times, but doesn't seem to be able to keep that up for like the entire fight. Like, does it, doesn't weaponize pace. She gets tired. She fades a bit. If you force her to fight high, uh, at a higher pace. She wants to fight at a relatively low pace. And she doesn't hit that hard. She doesn't have particularly great power. She has had bad wrestling in the past. She has looked better with the wrestling at flyweight, obviously. Um, quite a bit better, actually. Uh, I wonder, can I get, can I get her stats here real quick? Alexa Grasso. What is her takedown defense numbers these days? Granted, the takedown defense numbers never actually make what sense. 64% was taken down twice by Vivia Rujo. Wasn't taken down by Joanne Wood. Was taken down three times by Macy Barber. Uh, wasn't taken down by Jiang Kim, although that's not surprising. <laughs> um, you have um, someone who at, at straw weight was quite bad. And then at... Flyweight has been better defensively as a as a wrestler, but it's been against largely pretty poor technicians like uh, Barber. Barber and uh, Arujo have the physicality to be very good wrestlers, but their their technique is not very good. And you have well Joanne Wood um, and. Uh, Jiang uh, Kim, who are are just not takedown threats, full stop. Um, like Shoshenko should be able to out clincher, should be able to out wrestler, should be able to out grappler. Controls the range really, really well. Uh, if she wants to stay on the outside, she can. She's better kick her. Uh, as much as I think her striking is actually quite overrated, like people treat her like a, a striking god. And I, I don't. I don't think that's the case. I just don't see Grasso. Number one, I don't even know if Grasso is better as a pocket striker than Shevchenko. And that's her best bet to win. And she has no way to functionally keep the fight in the pocket. Also, if you'll recall, when Shevchenko had her humanizing, humbling performance against uh, Jennifer Maya, where Maya actually won rounds against her or a round. I don't remember if it was two. She came back and she dominated people. Like it woke up a sleeping dragon a little bit. And I think Alexa Grasso, unfortunately is going to be the one to get that. And I'm also just like incredibly tepid on this fight because I don't really think Grasso should be getting a title shot. It's not an anti Grasso thing or whatever. I think she should in the future, but I think if you look at it realistically, this should either have been the rematch with Tyler Santos, which maybe doesn't happen anyways because Santos pulled out of her fight with uh, Blanchfield when her um, one of her coaches developed uh, visa issues. I believe, I believe that was the case, and that would you know presumably happen here because same city, same geographical area. Or it should have been Manon Furo because I mean at least Manon Furo beat Caitlin Chukagian as opposed to Alexa Grasso beating uh, Vivia Rujo, who we're going to talk about later. And and to be clear, the position of Rujo on this card, I think, you know, adds credence to the fact that that is correct. Also, plus 450 to plus 600 underdog, plus six or minus 600 to minus 900 on Shoshenko, and that doesn't feel wide. Shoshenko by TKO. Uh, Jeff Neal versus Shavkat Rachmanov. Uh, Rachmanov, two inches taller, two inches extra of reach. I like Rachmanov. I still have, like, questions and concerns about him. He still hasn't fought a very high level of competition. And we're talking about him as a top 10 uh, welterweight, as a future champion, and so on. Which, this is going to come up with Ian Gary later. Uh, I do feel like he's a little bit premature. Just a little bit premature. Like, I, I feel better about him than I do about Gary, though. I'll give that as a spoiler right now. He is a long, rangy guy. 
He actually has pretty reasonable range control, and he likes to pressure and likes to get into wrestling, clinching. Uh, loves loves to submit people. Loves to grab your neck and 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 wring it. And um, I don't really feel like any of the real questions I have about him uh, are exploitable for Jeff Neal. Jeff Neal is a good athlete, a powerful hitter. He's game in the sense that like he has all those intangibles. He's not afraid of the fight. He's not panic prone. He's not uh, gas prone. But at the same time, his game is very... Not single track, but pretty single track. You know what I mean? Like dual track, I guess, or something like that. Very, very narrow. There we go. He is largely a headhunter with power punches. He will throw the occasional kick to the leg, but like it's a lot of it's a lot of just boxing and a lot of just headhunting when he really gets his way. And hasn't really been able to shut down people who want to wrestle him all that well. Um, I want to say, I want to say he has a loss that I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on right now. Yeah. Um, the E Magni fight, uh, ne- not E Neil Magni fight where, you know, Magni was able to suck him into the clinch and, and, and put him on his back. And that's essentially the same kind of thing. Rachmanoff is going to want to do, except better with more physicality and a heck of more fight ending lethality to it. Uh, he did beat Bilal Muhammad, though. I guess that means something. But Muhammad has nothing like the physicality Rachmanov is coming at with. That was back in 2019. Uh, anyways, uh, I'm picking Rachmanov to win this fight by submission. He is a major favorite at minus 500 to minus 590. And Neil is a plus 375 to plus 400 underdog that does feel a little bit wide and um people have asked me a couple times in the past like you you feel comfortable picking someone why do you feel like uh betting odds are wide well it's because like it or not the betting odds regardless of how confident you are in somebody winning they can be too big of a favorite i guess in a nutshell and i don't even mean like from a a betting value standpoint i just mean that you know, Neil is dangerous enough that he really shouldn't be this kind of underdog against a guy whose, um, you know, high water mark is still Neil Magny. But yeah, I, I got him pretty comfortably here. Uh, Mateus Gamrot versus Jalen Turner. Jalen Turner, five inches taller, five inches longer. Uh, Gamrot is your standard um, European wrestle boxer, I guess, like kind of ADCC level grappler who's built a boxing game onto his. Uh, onto his get wrestling game that actually fits pretty well. Like it, it, it feeds into takedowns really nicely. It allows him to uh, get things going in the right direction that he wants, which is getting things on the front foot and putting the pressure on you. Super tough, super durable guy as well. And uh, obviously a top notch grappler. This guy is one of the best grapplers in the division and uh, he's proven it. I, we're talking about a guy who did out grapple uh, Carlos Diego Feja. A guy who, it still means something that he just absolutely hossed Jeremy Stevens in 65 seconds. And, uh, you know, generally, generally it was his grappling that saved him against uh, Kutata Latze and got him to a split decision. And, of course, the Benil Dardiush fight, another of the best grapplers in division, and he gave him troubles. So, we're talking about a phenomenal grappler. Great shape. Keeps coming. Pushes a pace. Has built a game that, as as unimpressive as his striking is on its own, it is bolted on very, very effectively. There are problems in this fight. Obviously, I don't think he has a great. Uh, I don't think he's great at striking in space. I also think he's kind of heavy on his front leg, which Jalen Turner could use to feed him low kicks, pretty rep- ref- uh, uh, constantly. But I think that also will possibly feed takedowns to Gamrot. And with Turner, my big problem is he is not good at defending a single leg. He is not good at defending a proper single leg. Like we're talking like someone who comes in, cuts the angle and and really makes it makes things happen. Like Matt Frabola got the job done. Jamie Malarkey got the job done. 
And largely he's fought guys who are not very good wrestlers. Like the best wrestler he's fought is Matt Frivola and Frivola did get him down. So that's 77% takedown defense number he has is horrendously inflated by the quality of his opposition. And also admittedly the fact that he is good at stopping double legs and uh, body and uh, body locks. So, you know, he's not terrible. Like he's got a sprawl. He's got a decent body lock. He is incredibly strong, incredibly physical. He is a six foot three monster at lightweight. Um, and he's a way better striker. He's, and he's a very venomous striker. He's a very lethal striker. I just think that he's a little bit too pressurable in the sense that like if Matt Frivola and granted this, the, the fight with Frivola was a while ago. Let me get the uh, specifics here. The Matt Frivola fight was 2019. So we are talking four four fights ago, but since then he's fought Josh Kulabau, notably unphysical guy. He's fought Brock Weaver, terrible fighter by UFC standards. Rosh Medich, who has recently shown off some stuff, but like as a guy who's used to being the big bad wolf, they took that away from him. Jamie Malarkey and Brad Riddell. And uh, neither of those guys are going to fight a lot like, uh, I mean, I guess Malarkey kind of tried to do some of the things that uh, Gamrot's going to try and do. And again, he also successfully took him down. Um, I've got Gamrot as much as I think like the, 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 the sky is the ceiling for Jalen Turner. He's super young. He could be working on some things. He has looked a little bit improved every time out. But I do see Gamrot winning this deci- this fight by decision. Gamrot is a guy that if you are going to let him have takedowns, he is going to be really, really hard uh, to deal with. And he's going to stick with you. And, you know, we're going to see something probably akin to the Armin Saryukin fight that Gamrot had. And that was a great fight. So, like, I'm not complaining about that. Uh, Gamrot is the favorite at minus 170 to minus 230. Turner is the underdog at plus 145 to plus 193. Most boring fight on the card. And I don't know why this is on. I, I, well, okay. I shouldn't say I don't know. I know why this is on the main card. They want Bo Nickel on the main card. I disagree that they should, though. Here's my thing. Bo Nickel is a little bit of an attraction. But he's not an attraction that's going to drive you to buy a pay-per-view against Jamie Pickett. Like, if you put this and you said, Mike, you can watch this for free or part of your usual um, subscription. Sure, fine, whatever. But you asked me to pay for this fight. And I'm instantly not interested. Not interested at all and the betting odds are this is the minus 2000 fight um bo nickel is unproven in the sense that he hasn't really fought anybody dude has an incredibly wrestling pedigree and this is abs- this is absolutely actually the type of fight i would be giving him um i don't know if i would give him a pick necessarily but this is the type of fight you want to give him uh, essentially by ufc standards cans to crush and develop and get time in there to Continue to develop his skills while getting him paid and keeping him happy. But it should not be on pay-per-view. Put this as near to the feature prelim and let it let it sell you on the card. Let, let, it, let it bring in some wrestling fans who are not MMA fans for whatever reason. They can come in off that more that curiosity that this is Bo Nickel. This is an amazing wrestler. We are fans of Bo Nickel, the wrestler. We're going to come see him fight. And then, you know, you make fans you make uh, fans buy the car. Um, I just I just don't think I I just don't think you sell this. I don't think it sells the card in any way to have it have it on on the pay-per-view. I don't think it brings eyeballs. There you go. Uh anyways, it's going to win. Uh Pickett is the most unconfident, nervous fighter ever. He has none of the intangibles that I was talking about earlier. He panics. He loses confidence. He's actually got reasonable physicality. Like, he is not a bad athlete. But it is incredibly easy to shake his confidence in that athleticism. Um, he has no game that doesn't involve not clinching with a guy who has the wrestling pedigree of Bo Nickel. And he's probably going to get TKO'd 
if not submitted. I don't know. All right. Cody Garbrandt versus Trevin Jones. I'm taking these next two fights and putting them together, actually. Garbrandt, Trevin Jones, Derek Brunson, Drickus Duplessis, DDP. Because they're kind of the same. And in this regard, Garbrandt and Brunson are, are one side of this equation. Jones and Duplessis are the other side of this equation. Because you have Garbrandt and Brunson, who I believe are both the better fighters in this case. Uh, Cody Garbrandt is a surprisingly good wrestler. He is a violent striker. Has some creativity, uh, but has incredible defensive liabilities as a striker. Derek Brunson is one of the better wrestlers in his division at middleweight. He is a good athlete. He is also 39 years old. They're both get both of these guys are aging towards the end of their careers. And both of these guys have significant issues with fragility. In the case of Garbrandt, uh, I don't necessarily think he's necessarily fragile as much as dude will get hit with the hardest shots ever and has no idea how to avoid it. In Brunson's case, I do actually just think it's a matter of chin. Um, I've seen him get hurt and staggered by shots that just aren't particularly impressive. So the dynamic in both of these fights is do I pick the guy who is the better fighter or do I pick the guy who will probably, <laughs> probably has all the opportunities in the world to get a knockout in Trevin Jones and Drogas Duplessis who are both actually good finishers. I am going to go with Garbrandt to win because I have never had faith in Trevin Jones. Never at any point if I had faith in Trevin Jones. Dude has some creativity and some counter punching and whatever, but like I just see Garbrandt overwhelming him doing his thing. Um, it's going to look like basically if you remember his fight with uh, Timur Valiev, and Valiev beat him up quite badly until he got knocked him out, which I mean, I guess could happen here, but like I'm going to go Garbrandt and I'm going to basically split the difference and go with DDP, who despite the fact that I think he's a complete mess on every technical front, and we're going to talk about this more because he's got a teammate on the card in Cameron uh, Saman. MS, uh, what's what's uh, Saman's name again? He's got like... Uh, MSP. There you go. MSP. M uh, Cameron MSP Saban. Um, that gym produces guys who are just complete messes. And uh, <laughs> I don't really know if there's any good coaching there. Uh, Duplessis is a beast, though. Like, I think that's that's the difference. He's, he's an incredible athlete. Uh, incredibly durable. Gets tired. Keeps going. There has been some suggestions that that points towards certain um, performance-enhancing substances. He hasn't been busted yet. That's all I can say. And um, and a hard head. But he also thinks he's a good wrestler when he is absolutely terrible. Uh, don't do not let that Darren Till fight go to your head if you're in DDP's corner. Please, 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 please. Um, also, there's just the weird. There's the he is a bit of a weirdo though with the the whole. Um, I'm gonna be the first African champion. Blah 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 blah. Number one, I I don't I don't actually think he'll be an African champion. Um, and if he is, if he is, I'm going to make a bold prediction here that he is going to have to do what Kamaru Usman and what Izzy Adesanya did to become champion. He is going to have to leave Africa to pursue a better gym because looking at the, looking at the guys who come out of his team CIT gym, they are bad. They, they, they have like one or two decent skills and then it's either they pair that with amazing athleticism that leads to them you know doing well but will fall short of the title because once they hit like once he starts hitting guys like Marvin Vittori or Robert Whitaker or um heck I don't even know if I'd pick him to beat Sean Strickland or um or Brendan Allen um no nah, probably Brendan Allen probably Brendan but, um, yeah, once he gets up to that rarefied air of around a title shot, I think he's going to hit massive problems. But I do think he'll TKO Derek Brunson here. And I have Garbrandt by TKO as well against uh, Jones. So it's kind of splitting the difference there on the dynamic of these two very similar fights. Garbrandt is a minus 163 to minus 180 favorite. Trevin Jones plus 130 to plus 155. Duplessis is the favorite, 225, minus 225 to minus 250. Brunson, the underdog, at plus 185 to plus 200. There you go. 
Uh, all right. Let's go down to Vivia Rujo versus Amanda Hibas. Uh, Vivia Rujo is an inch taller, two inches longer. Hibas is fighting at 125 again, where she is relatively small. And But that's the problem is that's kind of the only thing I have against her at, in this matchup is, you know, Arujo's pretty strong, pretty athletic. Uh, surprisingly, um, to the older side of things, I for some reason I had in my head that Vivia Rujo was still kind of an up-and-comer. She's 36 years old, so not quite. Um, here's the thing. I have yet to see Vivia Rujo beat someone who has a decently high level athleticism and structure. She beat an athlete, Toledo Bernardo, who has no structure. And she beat uh, a trio of very good fighters, in my opinion, in Montana de la Rosa, KGB Lee, and Roxanne Modafari. But those are all fighters who are significantly lacking in physical areas. Like KGB Lee, very strong. Roxy's kind of low on all regards. And Montana de la Rosa, number one, is developing, I think, the wrong style. But number two is just kind of meh at all the physical aspects. Hebus is a bit of a beast. She's strong. She's powerful. She's fast. She's explosive. And um, that's something that we... And she's pretty structured. Like, she's she's not anyone's idea of, like, the most polished, amazing athlete uh, uh, fighter of all time. <laughs> um, oh, excuse me. But I do trust her game. I trust her. I trust her striking. I trust her grappling. And, uh, yeah, I mean, granted, there, there's the reach edge. There's the the ability to possibly work from an outside game, which has beaten Hibas before. But uh, Vivia Rujo is not particularly good at that. So I got Hibas by decision. I am surprised the betting odds are so close uh, because uh, Arujo is minus 105 to plus 110. So she is the underdog, but she's the smallest underdog on the card. And Hibosh, minus 120 to minus 130. I'm not sure who the smallest underdog on the card should actually be. But I feel like it shouldn't be a Rougeau. Maybe, maybe uh, Mana Martinez, Cameron Simon should it be the Ties fight. But anyways. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, Julia Marquez versus Mark andre Barrio. Uh, Marquez is one inches tall, uh, one inch taller, but has two inches less of reach. Interestingly enough, there are two ways this fight could go. There's the way that Barrio wants it to go, which is Barrio pressures Marquez into the cage, gets the clinch, works his power clinch game, which is pretty good. He's got a you know solid knees to the knees to the body, knees to the thighs, uh, can work takedowns in, kind of tireless. And uh, just really, really strong. And then there's the complete mess that Marquez wants it to be. <laughs> Where he kind of breaks free of the clinch and actually gets to do his fun things. Because he's a fun striker, a fun grappler. He's a mess, defensively. Like, he'll get hit in, like, every fight he has. And have terrible, terrible moments. And in no way will he avoid Barrio's clinch. But, yeah, that's basically the dynamic here. Crazy dude versus clinch dude. And uh, it could just be that Anthony Hernandez is light years better than I think he is. It could be. But the uh, fight that Barrio had against Hernandez really soured me on his, um, his abilities. It really suggested that there's just kind of a, a physical limitation to what he can do. And that beating Dolce Lunjambula, who gets tired very, very easily. Beating Jordan Wright, who is terrible. And beating Abu Aizaitar, who is terrible. Doesn't really mean a hell of a lot. And that the guy who, when he debuted in the UFC, lost to Andrew Sanchez, Christoph Yako, Jung Young Park, is more what we have with Barrio. That he's a guy who is largely going to beat people who are just absolutely flawed in a manner that they cannot overcome. And I think Marquez is a guy who is flawed. Absolutely. Kind of like Jordan Wright, he will self-destruct. But he doesn't self-destruct very often. Like losing to Gregory Rodriguez and having a contentious split decision with Licio Di Chirico 
is a better note than than what the than what Barrios wins are. He is a guy, you know, he did beat Phil Haas. He did beat Darren Stewart, who wants to do a lot of similar things to Barrio, although Barrio is a little bit better at them. And Maki Pitolo, Sam Alvey, and so on. And also, he was repetitively working for that Darren Wynn fight that got canceled like twice. So, and Wynn, and Wynn just has a similar idea of what he wants to do. So I'm going to go with Marquez to uh, win a decision just to have the bigger moments, the more chaotic stuff, and uh, and get the type of fight that he wants to have. He is the underdog, plus 105 to m- plus 130. I don't blame that. I don't blame that. I expected to be picking a dog when I was coming around to the idea I was picking Marquez. I actually expected to be a bigger underdog. And Barrio, minus 125 to minus 160. Ian Gary versus Ian Machado Gary, to be clear. Versus Song Kinnon. Gary is three inches taller, 2.5 inches longer. I I have a rant about Ian Gary that I'll probably have every time he fights. I am just not aboard the hype train. Uh, I find him cringe when he's talking the Octagon. Although I will say this. I was watching a YouTube video of his uh, where he's breaking down the top 10 welterweights in the world via the UFC ranking. So really, that's the top 10 welterweights in the UFC because uh, Amosov from Bellator is a top 100 uh, or a top hundred, uh, 10 uh, welterweight in the world. They may actually have even more. Um, he was a little more charming. He was a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more, um, not just like trying to be a completely low rent version of Conor McGregor. He's undefeated at 10 and 0. It's been against fringe UFC level talent. Like he's gotten the Patty Pimblet treatment. And I'm not saying that he is Patty Pimblet because to be clear, I do think that he is better than Patty Pimblet. Uh, I think that, like, you know, Ian Gary is actually a guy who's going to be in the UFC for a long time and he's going to climb and he's going he's gonna to have a top 15 ranking at some point. Whereas I think Patty Pimblet is kind of just useless. But the guys he's beaten in his 3 0 run are an 0 and th- two 0 and 3 guys, Jordan Williams and Darian Weeks, and 2 and 2 Gabe Green, who has significant limitations as an outside striker which is where Gary likes to be in the fight and has the frame to make it happen. I just don't see future champion, I guess is what I'm getting here at. I don't see the X factor that is going to make this guy a massive star. Um, He's a good range striker. He's got uh, variability on his targeting. He's got a little bit of creativity. He's got good form. He's got good accurate. He's very accurate, actually. Very, very accurate. Has pretty reasonable timing. Has a little bit of counters to like people trying to pressure him, but he can be pressured. Like Gabe Green was able to pressure him pretty effectively for a large part parts of their fight, fight, and he doesn't seem to hit that hard. Like he's not. Uh, does he have it? Does he even have a finish in the UFC? I think they're all decisions. Yeah, Gabe Green deci- Oh no, um, he finished Jordan Williams. I am wrong on that one. I am wrong on that one. But I don't. I don't. I don't think very highly of Jordan Williams. Anyways, I guess what I'm saying is I, 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 I have doubts, I have concerns, I have problems, uh, but Kadan Song does not ask any of the problems I'm, uh, I'm seeking. He is a guy who's probably going to be more than happy to fight at range with him, have a relatively low kickboxing match, uh, low output kickboxing match with him, low pace. He will not really... Pressure him all that well. Not really a grappler. Not really a guy who's going to implement a tremendous ground game for him. And he's a guy himself who's used to being the longer guy. I kind of see this being like the Max Griffin Kanan song fight in a lot of ways. And I kind of do think Gary will pick up a TKO here. Um, And he'll move to 4-0 and whatever. I... <sighs> He's just missing an X factor for me to really buy into the hype train. Maybe he'll show it. Maybe he'll show it. Uh, Gary is a massive favorite. Minus 649 to minus 850. Song plus uh, 450 to plus 550. Makes sense. Song has not been in the UFC in almost two years. Mana Martinez versus Cameron Saman. Uh, Martinez, two inches taller and three inches longer in the reach department. 
Uh, I'm not sure where now my, my hesitation before actually picking Mana Martinez, spoiler, is that he was a glory kickboxing or a glory MMA and fitness guy, aka James Krause's gym, and I cannot find a record of where he has decided to relocate to because presumably he's not training there anymore. We'll find out. Um he's not amazing at anything, and and he's kind of he's kind of got the Ian Gary thing where like uh, he was like a black belt at 14 years old or whatever. And people are like using that to hype him. And I, I just don't get it. Uh, I, I don't really get it. Uh, he's a fun action fighter. He's aggressive. He's creative. He's actually not a bad wrestler, not a bad grappler. Uh, he has no real limitation, uh, no real weak spots, but no real particular strengths. And Cameron Saman is a good kicker. That's the only part of his game I like. He is, okay, no, I, I do like that his scrambling. But his boxing is kind of messy, and his takedown defense is quite bad. That fight against Stephen Kozlo that he ended up winning. Kozlo is just not UFC material in any way, shape, or form. Like he's a 10th planet jujitsu guy who had no problem getting Saman down. Um I need to see him beat somebody with a game before I trust him at all. Uh, he is he is a product of the same gym that brings us Drigas to Plessis without the freakish athleticism part. He's not a bad athlete. There's nothing that says he can't become good. He's very young. I think he's like 21 years old. But I look at his fights and I just go, as much as I don't really have any faith in Mana Martinez, um... This is incredibly winnable for him, and he's got he's got that dog in him, and uh, I really this this is the fight I would bet on because plus two ten to plus two two fifty for Mana Martinez, yes please. Saman is a minus two fifty to minus three forty favorite. What are you guys doing, uh, Martinez by decision? Because I haven't fin- seen Saman get finished yet, or particularly hurt, and I don't think Martinez is a particularly dominant finisher either. So. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Jessica Penne versus Tabitha Ricci. I feel bad about picking Penne in this fight. She's the underdog at plus 195 to plus 265. Ricci, minus 230 to minus 340. Way too wide. Penne, four inches taller, five inches longer. Ricci is an out of weight. It's what it comes down to. She likes to pressure people and implement her jujitsu game from a top game standpoint. She's not a particularly high pace uh, scrambler or grabber of limbs and submission person, but like this is kind of like the the Pollyanna Viana fight that she just arguably lost because she was small <laughs> and she's fighting Penne who is getting old and whatever. And maybe the the maybe the wheels just fall off Penne in this fight. But um I just have a really hard time picking Ricci knowing that her way of winning is going to be kind of slow paced for the division. And is going to be control based and strength based, and she's just too small, and not a particularly great athlete. On top of that, not a bad athlete, but not a particularly great one. Um, so yeah, uh, going with Penne by decision. I don't think she finishes her because I don't think she finishes anyone at this point. But there you go. Uh, Ferid Basharat versus Damon Blackshear. I do think that this is a too wide of a fight because Basharat's a minus 410 to minus 500 favorite. Blackshear plus 330 to plus 365. I am picking uh, Basharat though. Two inches taller, one inch uh, longer in reach is Blackshear. Um, we've seen Javid Basharat, of course, fight in the UFC. Apologies if I mix the two up at any point here. Javid is the one that has gone 3 0. Farid is one as Dana White Contender Series fight and is here to do it. They really do fight very similar. Like this is the second coming of the Cole Miller, Micah Miller uh, brother scenario where they truthfully have the same limitations and the same strengths. Maybe not in like the same like literal levels um, because I mean, for example, Cole was a better fighter than Micah Miller. But like truthfully, this is not just they came from the same genetic material. This is they have come from the same molding process towards becoming a fighter. Uh, Farid is a uh, pretty reasonable outside kickboxer. He's a surprisingly good wrestler. 
He is actually quite vicious with ground and pound. That's the one thing I do think he's um, he's better than his brother at. Uh, he's a little bit more active, a little bit more vicious on top. And uh, does have some submissions, you know, but at the same time, uh, he's kind of lacking the power that makes me re... Both of them, both of them are kind of lacking that, like, little bit of power that'll put them over the top. Blackshear is a good fighter, but I do think he's missing some connective tissue. It's shown against uh, people when he's fought uh, kind of up to UFC radar. I mean, this is a guy who did lose five years ago to Chris Moutinho by decision that is... Not good, given Moutinho's run in the UFC. Um, I was impressed with him against the use of Zalal, but Zalal is a fighter who's facing um, an identity crisis, honestly, and also does not handle adversity and pressure very well. Basharat does. Basharat is beyond that. Uh, Blackshear struggles when put on the back foot. Basharat can do that. And I have him winning by a decision, but those odds are too wide. Loic Radzvanov versus uh, Esteban Ribovic. Uh, Ribovic is two inches taller, one inch longer. Ribovic is your standard uh, Argentinian prospect. We had it with, um, ah, damn it, who was the guy who fought Jamie Malarkey recently in the UFC? They've been doing this like, they've been signed, they're, they're in an Argentinian rush here. Uh, Francisco Prado, that's the one. Uh, where you have a bunch of like really athletic Argentinian fighters who could turn into something, who honestly could, but have no effective structure to their game, have not fought anyone that really asked significant questions. They're fighting the can openers of the um, Argentinian regional scene. And that's kind of all that the Argentinian regional scene kind of has. And this is not an anti-Argentine thing. I said this actually on... Um, I was doing commentary with a couple of Argentinian drivers for a uh, e, uh, sim racing event. It, this is not about the country of Argentina. It's about underdeveloped regions that the UFC science fighters from, because it goes for a lot of them is you have guys who are athletic and maybe good at one or two things, but who then lack the full structure of the game and the uh, connecting tissue to make their games actually work. And the only exception to this really so far out of, um, out of here has been uh, Santiago Ponsonibio. And if I recall correctly, the Argentine dagger, Santiago Ponsonibio, I think he fought mostly on the Brazilian uh, regional scene. Yeah, there we are. Uh, he exited the Argentinian scene in 2009 and started fighting more in like Sao Paulo, Amazon fight, Brazilian fight league. Santa, uh, Santa Carina uh, regional scene. He fought some guys who actually meant something like losing to, admittedly losing to uh, Leonardo Maffa, but like also fighting guys like Lucas Nascimento, who's not a terrible fighter, William Diaz, who's not a terrible fighter. Um, and then getting on to um, Ultimate Fighter, Ultimate Fighter Brazil, where he fought Tiago Santos. He fought uh, Marcio Santos, Clayton Duarte and uh, Leonardo Santos. On his way to, um, I think he won that season. Did he not? Just, might not have actually, because it says exhibition here. I, anyways, not important. But my point is, is like he's an Argentinian guy who, yeah, got his start there, but then quickly moved to the Brazilian circuit. Rebovich has not done that, and I'm going to have an exceptionally hard time picking for the, that 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 uh, that archetype of fighter that's coming in. Uh, essentially, because they're signing a lot of them. Uh, so I'm going with Radz uh, Radzahanovic. Uh, no, not Radza. Radzahabov. There you go. I, I really struggle with his name. I, I'm sorry. Um, he's another Tajikistan guy like um, <coughs> Aliyev, although... <coughs> Excuse me. I believe he trains in America. Um, predominantly. But... Uh, yeah, he had, a, he had a rough run in PFL, losing to like Alex Martinez, Rush Mafia, uh, Mafio, uh, Natan Scholti, Rashid Magomedov. Rashid Magomedov, by the way, really good. I, I wish he was still in the UFC. Um, but those are quality fighters. He was going to be on the Ultimate Fighter cast. The UFC got him this booking instead because apparently he's one of the guys that Connor uh, got kicked off the show. I don't know if that's anything about him specifically or or Connor just wanting to get his own guys on there. I've spoken about that before. 
Uh, I expected that to kind of happen. And, you know, I'm not super big on Loic. He's not amazing at defending low kicks, which could be a bit of a problem. He doesn't move his head very well, but he's kind of like that okay Russell Boxer guy who is pretty formed and and um, and structured. Um, he just he is um, a fringe level UFC fighter. Ribovich might become that, but I have my doubts that he is that right now. In fact, R- Ribovich, I, I could see being the... Again, this is a case where we're like, I could see Ribovich having a, a longer, better UFC career than Loic, but this is going to be a, um, a learning moment, a bump in the road that maybe makes Ribovich realize some things. Uh, Loic is the favorite, minus 250 to minus 300. Ribovich, plus 200 to plus 235. There you go. Uh, That's the fight card. I hope you enjoyed everything I brought to you today, and I'll be back on Sunday with the recap. Uh, Enjoy!